crazy. The average heterosexual uh, female had 25 different sexual partners before she got married and settled down. The average male, 15. 15% of all married couples were swingers. <laughs> Anybody know what a swinger is? Yeah. My very first day at LA City College, I walked through that breezeway and there was a free, uh, one of those little where you have the free handouts like Penny Saver and all that. It was a free swingers magazine with 300 listings and pictures of couples that wanted to meet with other couples for sex. Swingers magazines. Yeah, they don't have them anymore, guys. <laughs> and this one will blow your mind. The average homosexual had 5,000 different sexual partners in a lifetime. 5,000. Wait, it's for one person? I know, that everybody always says that. It's not possible. Yes, it is. Let me just explain it. Two blocks over here is the Flex Gay Bathhouse. Six miles that way is a straight gay bathhouse. I mean, straight bathhouse. In a bathhouse, you pay $25 to $30. You hang up your clothes. They give you a towel. You go and shower, and then you walk around, and if you find somebody you think is cute, you take them into a little bedroom that you rent for 20 bucks, and you have sex. And in that time, most gay men went to the bathhouse three days a week, and they had about four people each time, so they had 12 people a week times 52 weeks in a year, and that doesn't count going to Hawaii on holidays. <laughs> You can figure out that you can easily come up to five thousand. Okay, one, one person sleeps with five thousand, and how many in a year? That's in a year. Five thousand. In a whole lifetime, in a whole lifetime of sexual activity, the average homosexual in an entire lifetime of activity five thousand different sexual partners. Now, if each one of them had five thousand, can you see how a sexually transmitted disease would just explode? Each one of these 25 females had 25. Each one of these 50 males had another 50. You can see how the sexual... So you introduce into the country, one, you get rid of barrier protection. Two, you introduce IV drug use. Three, you bring in massive transfusions of blood. And four, the sexual action rate gets out of completely you know, uh, unrealistic, I guess you would say. You have, then, the perfect storm for sexually transmitted disease, a blood-borne sexually transmitted disease. And we're the only country in the world where the majority of the cases spread along airline hubs. Everywhere else in the world, it spreads along highways. In the United States, it only spread along one highway, Miami to New York, called the I-95 corridor, and then to all the airline hubs. No, it's just people. People having lots of sex, and they don't drive along the highways and stop at hotels and have sex. They go to this next city, and they go to the bathhouse there, and or whatever, you know. So, in the United States, it's spread by air by airline hubs and along the I-95 corridor. Now the funny thing is, there's one place in the United States it didn't spread for a long, long time. One small area of the country. Anyone guess what it was? San Diego. San Diego, for some reason, did not have a very high HIV rate uh, all the way up until 1984, where it's spreading massively everywhere else in the country. It didn't spread there. However, and this is how uh, patient zero came into being. Patient zero, they can, they can trace every, oh, they can trace back the first 400 people that got HIV in San Diego County to one man. And his name was Patient Zero, and he was an air steward for Air Canada. He was a Quebecer, and he was bisexual, so he went to the gay bathhouses and the straight bathhouses, and he had a little game. 
And his little game, and by the way, he was devastatingly handsome. If you ever see And the Band Played On, the guy who played him is ugly compared to this guy. This guy was like movie star quality. And he would take people and pick them up in the bathhouse and take them to the room and say, no, let's don't turn on the light. It's not sexy. And they would have sex with him, and then he would flip on the light and show them purple lesions and say, I have Kaposi sarcoma, now you do too. Wow. He was a real twisted guy. The CDC knew, they traced 400 people back to him, they contacted him, they said, his name was Gaetan Dugas. And they said to him, you know that this is a sexually transmitted disease. And he said, have you proved it yet? Because they hadn't proved it yet. He said, until you prove it, I'm going to do what I want to. Somebody gave it to me. Why shouldn't I share it? I'll take as many of you MFs with me as I can. And so there was no law at that time against sex, doing something where you knew you could infect another person. So if you ever read about patient zero, that's who they're talking about, Gaetan Dugas. And he's famous because the first 400 people in, in San Diego County can all be traced back to him. And they weren't all gay men. All right, so anyway, we, how we discovered the disease is what we're going to talk about last, and the virus. So anyone have any questions? Uh, one of the questions on the exam says, what is the reason that HIV spread so fast all over the United States? And like A, uh, massive amounts of gay sex, B, uh, sharing needles, uh, C, um, um, rebellion against the Vietnam War, D, the dropping of the condom and the sexual freedom of the uh, sexual revolution combined with the, uh, a tra sexually transmitted disease in the blood supply. That's the answer. All the other things contributed, but remember the big thing, if they hadn't dropped the condom, it would have not spread. If there hadn't been such massive amounts of sex, and if there hadn't been the dropping of the condom and using the birth control pill, it wouldn't have spread. You have yeah, so um, the U.S. bought uh, blood from... Blood products, plasma and blood products from mm -hmm. East Africa and the Philippines. And in that East Africa, it was always in, already in the blood supply. So what, where did New England come into place? That's who ran out of blood. The red blood banks in New England ran out. So we started buying from other people. Oh. Right. Is there a particular reason why New England, why that area ran out of blood as opposed to other areas? No, I don't know. So before we used to buy from them? And then no, we used to supply our own by people donating and all that. But well, when they ran out and it was a critical shortage, they did a stopgap supply by buying on the world market. So U.S. bought from the other Not U.S. The blood banks did. It wasn't the government that bought it. It was the blood banks. Like the Red Cross. When you go to get blood, you don't go to the government to get it. You go to the Red Cross or one of the blood banks. You know, they, you know where the, uh, a lot of the blood banks get their products, don't you, besides you donate? Go down here to Skid Row where they you use all the shooting up drugs and every day those guys go in there and sell their plasma and stuff. So that's where your, a lot of your blood products are coming from. Skid Row where they're selling their blood products and getting those $60 every week. Yeah, it's not such a good dream. Good thing. All right, so let's talk about the disease itself. Getting worse and worse. Yeah, it's interesting. Let's put it that way. All right, so the disease itself, a man by the name of Michael Gottlieb, he was a uh, medical researcher at UCLA Research Hospital. And at this hospital, uh, he did medical research and for fun, which I think is kind of a joke, uh, he had a small private practice because he didn't want to lose touch with patients and, and medicine, real medicine, he said, and just be doing research. So he had a small private practice. And Michael Gottlieb was not a medical doctor, he was a physician. What's the difference? 
Yeah. Right. Physicians treat the whole person. They look at the whole person. They don't just look at the symptoms you report. Most medical doctors are what we call symptomologists now. They're not physicians. They, when you go to your doctor, does he spend 30 or 45 minutes with you? No. No, he spends three minutes with you. And does he ask you about all of the other doctors, what they're prescribing? No. no. Mine doesn't. Does, does he know anything about your family history? Well, unless he reads the chart, he doesn't. What happens? You spit out a problem, he spits out a prescription, and if you don't call back, does he follow up? Do they call you and say, how's that going? Yours do? Mine don't. No. And so most of them are symptomologists. When you join, God, first of all, you couldn't walk in and say, I want to be a patient. He didn't take anyone off the street. People recommended him, and he would, and if you agreed to be, if he agreed to take you on as a patient, he gave you a diary. And you were to write down everything you ate and did for two weeks. You were to write down every other doctor you were seeing and every medication, vitamin, supplement you were taking, your dirty little habits. You know, the one where you say, oh, I only have one glass of wine a night when it's really five. <laughs> and I never do any drugs except for that joint on the end, after the five glasses of wine. And yes, I go to the gym. But, well, really, I just pay for the membership. I don't actually go. You know, all of those things, your, your, what exactly you ate, what your job is, your secret little, you know, he wasn't judging people. He just wanted to know the facts. And then he ran every test known to man on you, what they call shotgun testing, when you joined his practice. So he would have a baseline to see if there were any changes in your health. So uh, he would, he had set up his appointment so he had 45 minutes with every patient to discuss the whole rail. But right now, if you see three different doctors and you take these prescriptions, your eye doctor and your physician and maybe your uh, exercise therapist or whatever, you may take the prescription to three different pharmacies not being in the same group and no one would know if any of these things contraindicate each other. Because the doctor doesn't know everything you're taking. Doesn't ask, don't ask, don't tell kind of thing. So he was one of those that knew everything and this is why he noticed this disease what no one else did. He had between 1975 and 1979, he had 11 people, 11 men come in with PCP, Nemesistus Kareni pneumonia. This is a rare pneumonia that the only people that ever got it was people on radiation therapy. Radiation and heavy steroids will cut off your immune system and you can get Pneumocystis carini pneumonia. It was so rare in the United States that the treatment for it, pentamamine, was not even kept at the local pharmacy. It was only kept at the Centers for Disease Control in Atlanta. So if you came in with an unusual, rapidly progressing pneumonia, they would do a biopsy, they would confirm PCP, they would call Atlanta and fly the medication out to you. That's how rare it was, and yet he had 11 in his practice in just a few years. He also had 12 with Kaposi's sarcoma. Now who's supposed to get Kaposi's sarcoma? Old people. Little old Jewish men. People from the Mediterranean, men in their 80s. And was it fast or slow moving cancer? Slow. 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 These were people in their 20s and 30s. They were of English heritage or French or, you know, like the regular old white folks around here. They were not Mediterranean in origin and they were young and it ran fast all over their body, deeply involving internal organs and killed them in less than a year. So, what is unusual about this, these two diseases? The wrong people were getting them. You see, when you make cupcakes, you don't get cornbread. Medicine is always the same. It's a recipe. But you start out with the same ingredients, and you follow the recipe, and you get the same results. That's how they diagnose illnesses. It isn't that multiple sclerosis is some 
is in some people like this and in other people it's like a cold. It's always the same. And when the wrong people get a disease and the disease itself is not acting like it normally does, something new is involved. And he's the only person in the United States that noticed this. Now, yes, in the yellow journalism, those little newspapers that every uh, big city has, uh, probably the most well-known one being, um, uh, what's in Greenwich Village? The, I forgot the name of the little newspaper there. But anyway, in all the little uh, Village, Village Voice, in all the little pamphlet newspapers of little towns, you would see these headlines where uh, young uh, people dying of strange illness. Is this the swine flu? And there was, people were noticing that young people were dying of these strange illnesses, but nobody put two and two together. And so Gottlieb, once he noted that he was getting so many more of these people than he's supposed to, and by the way, if you looked up in a book, in an entire 40 years of practice, you would see one. He saw 20, what was it, 23. In four years, he saw 23 people with these diseases. And so he then went to see what they had in common. That's epidemiology. And one of the things he did was he ran the new T4 helper cell. This is a lymphocyte, a white blood cell, that is the command center of the entire human immune system. Every time a foreign protein gets in your body, this thing recognizes it as foreign and sends out lymphokines, which are little chemical messages, calling macrophages to the area and calling B cells that will then match with it and make antibodies. And the average T cell count for like him, big old beefy guy like him, and, oh, look like like look at her, that little thing right there that needs a hamburger. All right? So with the big old beefy guy, you'd have about 1,200 of those T4 helper cells per cc of blood. And with a little old weeny thing like her that needs a hamburger or at least two Big Macs, it'd be about 900 T cells per milliliter. When he tested these guys, one of them had three. The rest of them all had less than 25. Unheard of. You looked up in a book of the time, and they would say you cannot be alive with less than 500. Yet, they were sinking fast, but they had ridiculously no number, low numbers. So, he then interviewed them, and he found out this. They were all gay men. They were all highly sexually active. And of the 23, 11 of them had sex partners in common. In other words, they had sex with the same people. So, he wrote a letter to the Centers for Disease Control in Atlanta to the Sexually Transmitted Disease Branch, who was headed up by Jim Curran. And let's see, where's Jim? There's Jim. Jim Curran was head of Sexually Transmitted Disease at the CDC in Atlanta. And Jim Curran gets hundreds of letters every day from doctors and concerned people and whack jobs and everything else. And so, he didn't pay attention to the letter. He didn't even read it. His assistant, Mary Guinan, and if you see the movie, they'll go through some of this with you. His assistant, Mary Guinan, read the letter, which said, I believe that there is a very contagious, probably virus, disease spreading sexually that kills T cells. And my example, and he showed his death. And so Mary Guinan, his, his, Jim Curran's assistant, read it. And she was shocked and scared and all this. And she finally set Jim Curran down and read him the letter. And while Jim Curran is a little strange guy, first of all, you have to realize I hate the guy. So you can't get an objective thing out of it for me. But let's just say he's very strange because here it is. One minute after this whole disease has been discovered, and what's the test question? Who discovered the disease? Gottlieb. All right, one minute after he discovered it, guess what he, Jim Curran writes on the margin of the letter? 
hot stuff, this could save the CDC. Why? What had happened? Reagan was president. Reagan got elected with the moral majority behind him. His Secretary of Health declared that we have won the war on infectious disease. We have antibiotics for every bacteria. We have a vaccine for most viruses. All the important infectious diseases have been discovered. We are wasting money doing research on infected diseases. We need to work, spend more time on heart disease and chronic disease. And so it is a waste of money for the CDC to be open, a waste of money for the National Institute of Health. We're going to shut down the infectious disease laboratories and only keep one. And so there used to be a CDC West for the western United States in Phoenix, Arizona, and they'd already shut it down. There was a bill in Congress to shut down the Centers for Disease Control in Atlanta as a waste of money. There was already a freeze on hiring. And nobody, if you died or quit, nobody could be hired in your place. And so Jim Curran wanted to be not only head of sexually transmitted disease, he wanted to be Secretary of Health. And to be Secretary of Health, he needed what? A vehicle. He needed something big, and this was it. And he couldn't get there if they shut down the CDC. So he thought, instead of thinking, oh my God, this is the world. It's going to kill everyone in the world. Instead of thinking that, he thought, huh, this could save the CDC and I could be Secretary of Health. So, a little strange, I thought. But anyway, he put on the January 1981 MMWR. Anybody know what that is? Every week, the CDC sends a little pamphlet, usually about seven pages, to every doctor, every dentist, every medical facility, every clinic, and every library in the United States. It's called the Morbidity and Mortality Weekly Report. Morbidity and Mortality Weekly Report. Morbidity is how many people have a disease. Mortality is how many people die of a disease. And this is a weekly report. And inside, on the front cover, if you open it up, I used to have some here, but I don't have time to look for them. But anyway, when you open it up, it gives you the 21 notifiable illnesses that are regulated by the United States. There are 21 diseases that the federal government says that if you're diagnosed, private doctor or anywhere, you have to report this diagnosis to the CDC in Atlanta within 24 to 48 hours. Now they don't write, Don Hicks is a big old hoe and he got gonorrhea. They write a 61 year old male in area, white male in 90026 was diagnosed with. So they report it to the CDC and this is kept weekly. And the reason is they want to know if these diseases suddenly spike, they can immediately swoop in and do something about it. So the main thing of the morbidity and Mortality Weekly Report is the 21 notifiable diseases that are kept weekly numbers. Then on the front, newly approved drugs, new uses for old drugs, and uh, recommendations for dosage. Remember when they usually approve a new drug, it's for white men. Then after they approve for white men, they do more research and they find out that men and women are not the same and they give they standardize the dosage for women, and then finally they do it for kids. But it's always when it's first approved, it's white men. So they have the, that in there. And then on the last page of the MMWR is when the government wants to directly speak to every doctor in the United States. So on the last page of the January 1981 MMWR, current put, have any of you doctors in public or private service seen any unusual presentations of PCP pneumonia and Kaposi's sarcoma? Now, what did he leave out? This is the second time politics interferes with this disease, and it's only, what, a week old? He left out in sexually active gay men. That's the facts. You don't avoid the facts in science. You just put the facts there because it helps direct people to recognize new issues. 
later on they're asked ask him why, you know, when they go back in history and they interview him, they said, why didn't you put in sexually active, highly sexually active gay men? And he says, I'm not going to put the word gay on a government publication when Ronald Reagan's president. I'll never get to be Secretary of Health. <laughs> Again, these thoughts are not about the public, but they're about himself. Well, here's the unusual thing. He got 5,000 letters in the next two weeks. 5,000. That means that every one of those other doctors was not doing their job. People were coming in with PCP that shouldn't get it. Do you have radiation? No. Are you on steroids? No. Oh, you died. Oh, well. Huh. You've got Kaposi sarcoma. Are you from the Mediterranean? No. Jewish? No. Huh. My goodness, it's spreading fast. Oh, you died. Oh, well. Nobody putting any thing together saying, why is this happening? It's not supposed to happen this way. All they did was symptomology. Spit out a prescription, it didn't work. Click, that one's off. And move on to the next patient. Well, so what did CDC do? They sent EIS officers, Epidemiological Intelligence Service. If you haven't, if you're not married and and you want to do something exciting, this is it. Get a BS in any science and apply to become an EIS officer. They take you to Atlanta, they train you for two years, and then they send you everywhere in the world. There's an outbreak of disease. Every county health department has an EIS officer. And if you do really good at that, they will bring you back to Atlanta and they will pay for your master's or medical school or PhD. So EIS officers probably, I regret, I applied for it, got accepted, and I regret that I didn't take it. Is it paywall? I really wish I, um, Is it paywall? No. <laughs> <laughs> no, it pays, it's government, GS, you know, you get a, probably the same as a GSA. But you get to go around the world? You get to go around the world, and you get to all your schooling paid for, your degrees paid for, oh, wow. and, you know, the only bad thing is, you know, they're not going to move your family with you and you can't say, well, my kids are in school. Oh, they say, don't cover No, you're getting on a plane to Kampala tonight. <laughs> All right, so anyway, they sent EIS officers to interview every one of these letters to find out if the people were still alive, if there were any frozen back bloods or tissues, to get a description of every step of the disease if they were dead. And they came back to Atlanta and put together a description of the signs and symptoms of this disease, which they named, mistakenly, this is now the third horrible mistake in this disease, gay-related immune deficiency disease. Why is it a mistake? Before it was not a mistake, it was a mistake not to mention the word gay. Now it's a mistake to make it. Why? Because everyone in the United States said, oh, I'm not gay. Therefore, I don't have to be cautious. I don't have to worry about this disease. I don't have to use condoms because I'm not gay and I don't date anyone that is. Gay-related gay immune deficiency disease. So, the disease was discovered by Gottlieb. The CDC was able to get thousands of blood samples. They got about 3,000 in this response because you're going to need those blood samples, remember, to prove that a certain microbe causes a specific disease, everybody that's got the disease has to have the microbe. So this becomes incredibly important. All right, so what about the actual causative agent of the disease? Well, we have to go back to a man by the name of Robert Gallo. And we've got to go back even further than that to the 1960s. In the 1960s, medical scientists discovered that animals can get cancer from viruses. Before that, we believed that all cancer was caused by mutation, genetic mutation, inherited genetic mutation, radiation, or chemicals damaging DNA. We never imagined that there was a cancer virus. And when they discovered Rouse sarcoma virus in mice, then the conclusion came to the scientist's head, there's got to be a human cancer virus. And there became a mad scramble to be the first person to isolate a human cancer virus. 
And of course, if you're going to isolate the very first human cancer virus, you're going to be the most famous scientist in the world. So, and by the way, these guys will kill their mother to get the Nobel Prize. In a second, you know, mom, oh, if I kill you, I get the Nobel Prize. Bye, mom. I mean, you have no idea what the, I have seen them do. I have seen them sabotage each other. I have seen them lie to each other and tell the other lab what they know will kill their experiments. I have seen them give them misinformation. I have seen them omit things that will keep the experiment from working and chuckle. I have seen them sabotage each other, like go into the... Uh, See, oh, look, this card reader says that Dr. Kalaman was in here, and all our incubators have been turned off, and all the cells are dead. I wonder how that happened. At the CDC, all the time, they would go upstairs, and we even caught one guy on camera spitting in other scientists' experiments to contaminate them with bacteria. Wow. So they, they, are, they can be really scummy, what they will do. All right, so anyway, uh, everybody began looking for the very first human cancer virus, and one of the things that was discovered was that many of the cancer viruses were RNA, and in lower animals, reverse transcriptase was in one of those. So they had the reverse transcriptase assay, and they knew that in lower animals, retroviruses were important causes of cancer. So, how are you going to find a human cancer virus? Where would you look? A human. You would look for types of cancer where the people that got it had either had sexual relations with each other or a person that had this type of cancer gave donated blood that was used by another person that got the same cancer. Get it? So, Dr. Gallo found off the coast of Japan a number of little islands where they had a node of a very unusual kind of leukemia. And this leukemia is called hairy cell leukemia because the little lymphocytes, instead of being sort of amorphously round, they had a lot of little projections. They looked like little hairs all over them. They're abnormal cancerous leukemia cells. And what he discovered was that people that had had sexual relations, like if the man got the cancer and his wife often got the cancer. And anybody that he donated blood to also got the cancer. So he began trying to isolate it. And the very first thing he noticed was in the blood of some of these patients, he found reverse transcriptase. And that was only found in RNA, RNA lower animal viruses at the time. So he began working on it, working on it, working on it, but he couldn't quite get the virus. Over and over he tried to isolate it. Couldn't get it. And then he got a phone call some from friends, which is really sort of a gossip line among scientists. They always call each other and gossip and try to mislead each other or, you know, it's really bizarre. Anyway, his scientist friends in Germany called him and said, the Germans were about to announce that they had discovered the first human cancer virus. Well, Gallo was enraged because he'd been working like five years on it, and he was certain he had it, but he hadn't gotten it isolated. So, he announced he had discovered it. And people waited. Remember, if you have a real scientific discovery, what's supposed to happen the next day? The paper is supposed to come out in a peer-reviewed, reputable journal. No paper came out. They waited weeks and weeks. <laughs> Finally, a paper comes out, and other labs get it and try to isolate the virus, as it said in the methods, even using bloods from the same islands, and got nothing. And so there came this little background. <laughs> and finally, it got to such a state that by 1977, the National Academy of Science is asked to investigate Dr. Gallup because he claims he has the first human cancer virus, but he won't share it. And none of his papers about it are replicable. Nobody can replicate his results. So they investigate him for over a year, and they come to the conclusion he lied, that he didn't have it. 
So they, set, they contact him in, and they tell him that they are going to charge him with scientific fraud and he's going to lose all of his government contracts and this paying this. And they set a date for like November the 1st. Two weeks before then, he isolates the virus. So what do you do? Here he is, the most famous scientist in the world for isolating the cancer virus, which he didn't isolate. He lied. He published papers that are not replicable. Everyone knows he didn't do it, but before you charge him with a crime, he does it. That's right. What they did was they reprimanded him publicly, and then they made him withdraw his papers and correct them. But he basically got away with it. Now remember this, because he's going to do it again. Remember, when you let people get away with something, they repeat it. Yeah? Can you say his name one more time? Gallo. Robert Gallo. Just like the wine. All right, so this is wonderful. And a few months after, oh, by the way, he named it HTLV1, which stands for Human T-Cell Lymphotropic Virus in Roman numerals. Run. One, lymphotropic means uh, loving white blood cells. Remember, what is cancer? Too many or too few white blood cells? Too many. Too many. What's HIV? Too few. few. They're the opposite of each other. All right? So, a few months later, from bloods taken among uh, Indians and local people in the Caribbean, he, does, he and a, a man from India called Kalyana Raman, isolate the second human cancer virus, the second leukemia, called Caesaric cell leukemia. So peri cell leukemia and Caesaric cell leukemia, the first human cancer viruses, all having reverse transcriptase and discovered by Robert Gallo. Then, Gottlieb, remember, this is 77 and 78, Robert Gallup, Gottlieb discovers this grid. And so everybody in the world begins looking for the causative agent of grid. And Gallo is working and working, and remember, he is now the most famous retrovirologist in all the world. He actually has a meeting every year of all the retrovirologists in the world giving the latest papers. And remember, most of them are students of his or trained by him because he's the most uh, famous guy in the world. This is called Cold Spring Harbor Conference on Retrovirology. And it was every year. And he was convinced that it was drug abuse plus this one of these viruses that causes AIDS, which at that time, remember, Grid. And so he began doing a lot of work. Um, everybody else was looking for the causative agent of this disease that Gottlieb had discovered. Meanwhile, one of his students, her name was Marie Sinusetti, had been trained under Gallo at the National Cancer Institute. And by the way, you need to know something about the National Cancer Institute. It is a research organization, but it was set up by Nixon to try to hide Watergate. You see, he was in trouble for Watergate, and he thought, sure, that maybe if he diverted the attention of the American public, everybody would forget about the illegal things he did in Watergate. And so he, in one of his um, State of the Union speeches, he did the American thing. He declared war on cancer. You know, we have the war on terrorism, the war on the illiteracy, the war on disease. This is the war on cancer. And he declared war on cancer, and he set up a new research agency called the National Cancer Institute. It's outside of the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases. It's outside of the CDC. It's outside of the National Institute of Health. If you work for the CDC or the NIH or any of those, you work for the U.S. government, and you are given a salary called a GS rate. If you're a private in the Army, you work for the U.S. government, you're a GS-1. The highest rating 
in the U.S. government is GS-100. That's the President of the United States. You, no one can make more than the President. And for years he made 250000 Now I think he makes 400000 But anyway, that means that you don't get the best scientists at the world to work at the NIH or the National Allergy and Infectious or the CDC because they can't pay $20 million like Burroughs Welcome or Eli Lilly can. And so uh, it was a big problem. And so when Nixon wanted to set up the National Cancer Institute, uh, he went to the scientists and he said, how can we get the best scientists at the National Cancer Institute? I'm going to set it up and it's going to report to the executive branch not to the uh, Secretary of Health and Human Services. So it's going to have different rules for it, even though it's going to be a U.S. government agency. And so what they did was this. They can pay competitive salaries, but better than that, they can never pay outrageous ones like, you know, the guy, what was it, GE got $55 million as CEO, and he got a bonus, you know. How do you spend $55 million? I mean, the people in Japan look at us like we're insane. None of their CEOs get paid these outrageous, the head of Toyota doesn't get paid like that. But we paid the guy who brought General Motors into bankruptcy, he got $22 million bonus. But anyway, they can pay them fairly competitive, but the big thing is, if I work at CDC and I discover some wonderful thing on government time, with a government salary, in a government lab, with government equipment, it becomes the property of the people of the United States. But if you work at the National Cancer Institute and you discover something, 25% of the profits go to you personally. So this is a big pull to get the best scientist, and it was big for Gallup. That's why he went there. And so, anyway, uh, the National Cancer Institute was where he was at, and he trained Barry Simusay who was head of retrovirology at the Pasteur Institute in Paris. So at the same time, everybody's looking for this disease, the causative agent. All right, so the French, what they do is they find an air steward that his name was Bruce, and he was on the route from Kinshasa Zaire to Paris. He worked that route for something like seven years, and he had the first sign. What's the difference between a sign and a symptom? Anybody remember? Four days. Signs are observed from the outside. Symptoms are self-reported. He had the first outward sign of this disease. And the very first outward sign, 15 years after you're infected, is the first time there's a sign that makes you any different from anyone else. Remember, if you go out and you have sex with 42 people tomorrow and you get infected with this, it will be 15 to 20 years before there is any visible change. Nothing will detect it except for a blood test. And that won't be positive until 90 days after the dirty deed. So, the first visible sign is persistently swollen lymph, lymph nodes, size of a key line. And they don't go down. You know, you get a sore throat, you get swollen lymph nodes, they go down in a week. These are, for a year or two, as big as a lime or a lemon. And they can't even put their arms down because they're so sore. It's called lymphadenopathy. So Bruce had lymphadenopathy, and by the way, in women, the first sign is recurrent yeast infections. You get a yeast infection, you get it cured, and a week later you get another one. You get it cured, and a week later you have another one. Okay? And over and over and over and over. That's the number one first sign in women. The number one first sign in men is lymphadenopathy. All right, so the Institute Pasteur began search for this disease as well, and they decided to take roots and remove the lymph nodes, homogenize them in sterile saline, and give them to every different lab at the Institute Pasteur. So the people in mycology look for fungi, and the people in bacteriology put it on bacteria and dishes and electron microscopy did it. And one of the labs that got this homogenated, homogenized uh, lymph node was Barry Sinusay's retrovirology lab. Remember, she already knew how to do retro throw white blood cells and do reverse transcriptase assay. She was trained under Gallo. 
So when she got the liquid from the homogenized lymph nodes, she put it on white blood cells. They, had, they weren't a continuous cell line, it was just donated white blood cells, packed white blood cells, lymphocytes. And she put it on, and she didn't expect anything, and they died in 30 minutes. All of them exploded in 30 minutes. And she freaked out. She knew she had something, but, you know, on a little flask like this, you're not going to get anything. It's too small. You don't have enough production. And she did it again, and the same thing happened again. And she did it again, and the same thing happened the third time. So she went to her boss, Luc Montagnier, head of retrovirology and virology at the Institute Pasteur, and said to him, what do I do? And he said, well, don't you feed a newborn baby every couple of hours? Why don't you feed new white blood cells every 10 minutes into this culture? And so she did, and she, remember, it's an oncogenic virus. She got a continuous cell line. The cells kept dividing the more you fed them. And when she assayed the fluid, she found reverse transcriptase. Now, at that time, there were only two viruses on Earth that a human being produced reverse transcriptase. What were they? Which two? HTLV-1 and HTLV-2 were the only things. And if you... So she sent her sample, which she named the virus LAV, lymphadenopathy associated virus. She sent fluid to electron microscopy for, to see what it looked like. And if you look at HTLV-1 and HTLV-2, they have what's called fried egg appearance. They have an electron-dense genome region that is circular. You can see it at the back of the room there. Look at the first two electron micrographs of virus particles. The first two, the first one's HTLV-1 and the second one's HTLV-2. See it on the wall back there? This is them budding out of lymphocytes on the far right and on the far left. And in the middle, you see the viral particles. This is HTLV-1, this is HTLV-2. Fried egg appearance. All right? Hers looked like this. It had a very ovoid, electron-dense region. Not circular, not fried egg at all. So she knew she had discovered a novel or a new human retrovirus because it wasn't the only other two. So hers look like this. She freaked. She was excited. Very soon say, it's, uh, you'll see it in, in the notes there. So anyway, now, how do you prove that a particular agent causes a specific disease? What has to happen? Everybody that's got the disease has to have this agent, has to have this virus. And where was the only place in the world where they had 3,000 bloods from people who had died or had grid? Yes. CDC. So at that time was when I joined the CDC. Don France, I, when I first went to the CDC, um, they weren't hiring. And when I finally got a job, my job was in diarrhea. Really? Yes. My job was to arrive at 7 o'clock in the morning, every morning, go down to the mail room and pick up dry ice containers of frozen diarrhea samples from all over the world. And then to come up and serotype them to follow strains of diarrhea from, that were like taken from food samples and then from the people that ate the food to see if that was what caused the diarrhea, blah, blah. It was not fun. Did you apply for that, or you just applied to the CDC? No. I, I applied to the CDC, and I was grateful for any job they would give me because they had frozen hiring, and uh, because I pulled the old I'm crippled disabled card, and they didn't freeze hiring for the disabled. So really? that's how I yeah, that's how I got the job. Reagan had frozen hiring, but when I walked out of there after interviewing, the lady says, "Why are you limping? Did you hurt your foot?" 
And I said, I am limping, I didn't hurt my foot. And she says, well then why are you limping? And I said, because I had polio, lady. And she said, there is no freeze in hiring for the disabled. And I went, oh God. <laughs> <laughs> and then she said, be here at 6.45 Monday morning. And I said, Said, we start at 7, and you've got to fill out papers, so be here at 6.45. So I got there, and she said, this is Marilyn Montero, and she's your uh, boss. She heads the, uh, oh God, what's the name of it? I tried to put it out of my mind because I hated it so bad. Mm -hmm. I might go back to you, the mycoplasma. I forgot what the name of it was, but anyway, she said, she's, heads this typing lab. And I go, oh, that's so exciting. She says, yeah, yeah. So I'm walking through all, the, there's 16 buildings there. And, you know, you have to car key through every hall because it's all high security. And we're car keying and I'm just talking to the bad, you know, to, and this lady looks at me and she says, you don't know what, ah, you don't know what Campylobacter typing is, do you? I said, well, really, I don't remember what's Campylobacter. She says, diarrhea, contagious diarrhea. You're going to be typing 500 samples of di contagious diarrhea every morning and 500 every afternoon until you die or quit or whatever happens. <laughs> <laughs> and so every day at lunch, I went to the transfer board and looked for transfers to other labs in the CDC. And I saw one that says, we found a new disease. It's 100% fatal. It's terribly contagious. We have no treatment. No one will volunteer. Please volunteer. Yeah, and I volunteered, and most people, I, most people think I volunteer because I'm really sweet and wonderful and loving and all that. I volunteered because of one and only one reason, no more diarrhea. <laughs> and because I was trying to write my dissertation, and the best, you know, do you want to write your dissertation on diarrhea? <laughs> Will anybody read it? Can you brag to someone you did your di di dissertation on diarrhea? No. And besides that, how much new information is in diarrhea? <laughs> but if you get a whole new disease that nobody's ever discovered anything on, it's very easy to get your dissertation. So I volunteered for that reason, and I was the only technician. If you see that movie, Anne de Bayonon, played on, you will see our lab. It is hilarious. Our lab was the size of that bench times two. That's it. That was our entire retrovirology lab at the CDC for grid research. We, it was so small, there was no desk, there was no chair, there was a biohazard hood, and there were four incubators for human cells, and the carbon dioxide drums had to be kept put in the hall because there wasn't enough room for them and us to be in there at the same time. I was his only technician. And you can see my very famous I'm very famous, yeah. The very first scene of him in there, it has me bringing vacutainers of collected blood from patients, and I trip and fall and break them. And I reach down to pick them up without gloves on, and he screams out, are you crazy? Wait, is that in the movie? That, yeah, that's me. It wasn't, I mean, it's a person representing me on an actual real event that really happened. Did they interview you for the movie? Interview? No, they interviewed Don Francis. He was in, obviously a technician. Oh, so then he just, okay. But they just show me in the movie. They don't even say my name. They just say, you know, this is Don Francis' technician. Oh my God, look at him. He's picking that. Try to pick that up with his hands without gloves on. Anyway, so you can see Don Francis and me and all that. This, these are all the people at the CDC lab when, when, they, when we discovered HIV AIDS. But anyway, so uh, Barry Sensei was trying to prove that this agent, LAV, causes the disease at that time was called RIT. And so she wanted to do what is known as an ELISA, which stands for Enzyme-Linked Immunoabsorbent Assay. And you can do an ELISA on every infectious disease. It is the easiest way to diagnose disease. If you want to do a mumps ELISA, you coat this little plastic plate, these little wells are the size of a pencil eraser, you coat the plate with the antigen. Remember, antigen is the 
agent of disease that stimulates the immune system. Anything that turns the immune system on is called an antigen. So you coat the plate with the antigen. So if you want to do a mumps ELISA to see if somebody has mumps, what do you coat the plate with? Mumps virus. If you want to do a polio ELISA, polio virus. If you want to do a diphtheria, diphtheria bacteria. So she wanted to coat the plate with LAB, that's the antigen, and then she wanted to do take, remember if you get infected with something, every all of your entire blood has antibodies to that antigen in it. So you need patient blood serum. So you take patient blood serum and you dilute it 10% with sterile saline and you put it on here and then you add the enzyme horseradish peroxidase because all antigens have a specific shape and the antibody that fits to them covalently has a specific shape for that antigen. And when they stick together covalently in the presence of horseradish peroxidase, that oxidation reaction turns dark. So, everybody is familiar with peroxidase. Have you ever cut a banana and left it out? What happens? It turns brown or black. How about a potato? Same thing. How about a radish? When they turn brown, that's peroxidase, oxidizing. So in the presence of an oxidizing reaction, peroxidase turns dark. So if the patient's blood has antibodies to what's on the plate in the presence of horseradish peroxidase, it will turn yellow, depending on which horseradish peroxidase you use, you can get one that turns blue. A lot of people use the blue one, but we use the yellow one. Okay. It will turn yellow. If the person does not have antibodies to what's on the plate, it will remain clear. So, she needed positive bloods. And the only place in the world where they had more than one or two was the CDC that had 3,000. So they called us up, Montagnier called us up, I remember because we, were, we, didn't, we weren't really doing much at that time. We didn't have anything other than I was going out to collect bloods from the local hospital, from everybody that had the disease, because the nurses wouldn't go in the room. They would put these red patients down at the end of the wall, hall, nobody would go see them. I went and saw they had food trays piled up out in the hall and drug trays went in, the guy's in a bed full of pee and crap, and even his IV bag was empty. No one would enter the room. And my, the only thing we did at that time was collect blood and tissue from volunteers that were dying just so we would have something. But we got a call from Montagnier, and he said, we think we've got the virus that causes this disease. Can you send us bloods to prove it? And so we said, sure. Don Francis said, we'll send you 76. And so they sent him 76 overnight by Delta to Paris the next day. And we expected to hear back from him in two days. It takes 40 minutes to do this. If you purify the virus, you coat the plate, you, have, you got it. And if you've got your atlas, open up and read the ELISA. It's really wonderful, cheap little test. So anyway, we expected to hear. We didn't hear anything. A whole week went by, we didn't hear anything. Ten days, didn't hear anything. At 14 days, Don Francis lost his patience and called Montagnier and said, what happened? And he said, it didn't go well. And we said, what do you mean? He said, we only got 26 positives. And Don Francis said, we only sent 26. He said, no, you sent 76. He said, no, we only sent, we sent 76 bloods. We only sent, of those 76, 26 were positive. You see, you don't tell people the answer and send them the answer. It's science. They should be able to pick it out. So my blood is in there like 12 times. Don Francis is in there like 10 times. And the other lab assistant, uh, Jane Getchell, her blood's in there the rest. These are all fakes. We put them at random in there with 26 bloods from AIDS patients. Because you don't tell people the answer and then say, what's the answer? 
The answer is 23. What's the answer? 23. <gasps> you got it wrong. It's science. So he thought they had it. We had sent them all pos 